is the Discuss Metal Podcast with Evan Baker and Jesse Gentry of American Arson. Hosted by Dan Terry. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. Is that a picture of Chuck Norris behind you? It is. Is it a whole poster of Chuck Norris facts? <laughs> yep. That's Let's see. Let me read. Let me, if it, huh, let me find a good one. Um, can you still hear me good? The The microphone should be on my... Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Chuck Norris was an only child, eventually. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> Chuck Norris uses a stunt double during crying scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Norris can blow bubbles with beef jerky. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, 20, keep going. it's 2010 up in here. <laughs> I love it. I have the pleasure this evening of sitting down with Jesse and Evan of American Arson. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing well. Doing all right. So uh, I got I got to ask you guys, uh, where, where where are all the other guys at? Isn't there like five guys in your band? <laughs> we don't let them show their faces or, or talk on anything. We just kind of hide them in the back. Yeah, they're behind the curtain. It's kind of like a Milli Vanilli situation then. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are just the, the days till we get caught. There you go. You guys are just the pretty faces for everybody to see. <laughs> yeah, Something yeah. Like that. We didn't. We didn't do too well. If that's the case, but I can relate. I mean, I've got a face for podcasting, so you know, <laughs> it works out really well. <laughs> so this is this is cool. Um, so I, I have to admit, uh, my show typically um, we're discuss metal and we talk about metal and hardcore and all that stuff. You guys are a little out of my wheelhouse, but only a little. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and that's, that's actually what I really, uh, why I was kind of excited to, to get this interview going because um, you know, you guys have, you guys have a brand new single out um, like, like brand spanking new and um, yeah. yeah for a record that you know is is gonna take after i basically after i've heard unbreakable i i was like oh cool i'm gonna check this i'm gonna check this uh record out and then i was like oh it's not out yet okay because <laughs> we live in a world of instant right. gratification now so it's like you hear a band and you're like oh cool and i'm gonna be totally i'm gonna be totally frank with you guys i listened to your guys's previous material over the past week um, I wasn't super familiar with the band, but I was super familiar with Face Down, and so I was like, That's you awesome. know, yeah. So it's like, you know, I, I I should check this out, and so I checked out Unbreakable, and I loved, um, I loved the energy being brought forth by two guys. I mean. That's <laughs> you, you. You don't usually get this type of aggression out of out of just two dudes. And um, I loved the guitar well, tone. You. I loved the 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 frantic drumming. I love all of it. And um, so you know, with Unbreakable, I just kind of want to start off with talking about that song in particular because that's what everybody can go hear. You know, um, yeah, right now. Um, so like, well, I guess uh, this so this is cheesy interview question. Um, what was your guys' inspiration for the song? And um, what 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 are you guys hoping to accomplish with it? I, I think, um, yeah, this is, I've been thinking a lot about uh, these kind of questions now that we have a full length album coming out because we've, we've always done EPs in the past. So um, now that we have a full length album coming out uh, and I know that there's going to be a lot of questions like this, um, you know, just uh, what is this? What does this song individually mean? What is the album kind of? What are some concepts that go throughout the album? And so um, we talked about this. Uh, we did like a live stream the other night. Um, but I've, I'm in the process of putting together a um, a video where I go song by song, just through the album and just kind of um, talk about each one. Um, so I'll just give kind of the the short synopsis, I guess. Unbreakable is really a song about um, feeling like you pushed past something um and then having that thing uh sort of come back around on you uh and and wondering if if you really have uh put it in the past um and then sort of making a decision to to keep um to keep pushing back so uh there's more that goes into it than that i told the people on the live stream the other day i have a map for this one so the explanation <laughs> gets really deep I, I, literally, I literally have a map um but uh but yeah it's uh, I, I think it's a something that we talked about with jason um 
who runs Face Down Records is that it's a it's a song for right now. It's a song that a lot of people um, can apply to their lives. So for now, just leave it hanging Which out we there didn't know at and the let time people of, apply it. Of writing, it kind of worked out. Like, well, not worked out because no one would, no one wants us to be in this situation including ourselves, but like we, as much as we were like bummed because of, you know, just the overall situation surrounding the the current virus and everything in, in the lockdown, but also, um, you know, for bands and artists having to cancel plans, like you said, just the theme of the song. Um, we didn't, I don't think we really realized it fully <laughs> until it, it came out last week and people started responding to it and saying that same thing of like, this is like exactly what we need right now. Like, and it, it, it really, really did, um, I think unexpectedly come through at a, a needed time, but yeah, he nailed it. Well, and speaking on that too, you know, obviously, you know, you drop, you drop a single in the middle of this and you guys have the record and there's so much excitement about, about writing the record, putting it out. It's your first full length, you know, uh, record. And it comes out it it you know from from some people's perspective at the worst time possible where you guys can't hit the road on it, you can't um you know you almost feel feel shackled <laughs> down yeah um was there any fear about that as the released you know kind of came forward like do we want to put this out or do we want to wait, or was that a decision Absolutely. you guys made or yeah there's a lot of hand wringing over it I think our number one thing was that we wanted to support the release with a tour. Um, not only did we have a tour planned that we didn't actually a get a chance to announce. Tour too. Yeah, but we also had um, some festival dates, um, a couple that had been announced and a couple that hadn't. But, um, and, and you know, I mean, every, every album is a financial investment for the artists, um, whether they're on a label or not, uh, because, even an artist on a label needs to to recoup for the label, and um, and so the the inability to be able to get out on the road and do that was certainly, um, you know, a point of consternation for us. But it, but in the long run, um, we can't hold on to this forever. So we did we did push the release back from when it was going to be. Um, but you know, bottom line is um, the world keeps turning, and and um, people need to they need new music um you know it's uh we you know it's a sort of the show must go on type thing so eventually when we get the opportunity to um we'll play some shows and we've already rescheduled some of them and and we might not have rescheduled them for late enough with those might get rescheduled as well but it's, it's um, kind but of a now, point now of the music out. just rescheduling a few months ahead of time and kind of hoping for the best like, yeah. you know, I have I have some some friends and we both have some friends and bands that are, you know, well more established than ours and on even bigger tours and stuff like that. And it's it's the same across the board from the local scene and all the way up to the, the stadium shows of like it's, it's, at this point, it's, it's such an unknown. Um, but it was it was I think we're at a point now where we're a little more not okay with it um because again we don't want to be in this situation but we're at peace with it i guess is a better way to say it um and and like you said the song fitting in with the times um kind of helped us realize that you know maybe like you know it, it worked out the best it could have possibly for us and we were super bummed to have all those dates canceled but now we're kind of looking on the bright side of like hey well like you know, maybe it wouldn't be getting streamed as much at home. Like if, if, uh, you know, we had dropped this and everybody was still, you know, working and, and like busy and, and everything. So, you know, who knows, it could have been some sort of benefit in terms of the online traction for a smaller band like us to people spending more time on social media and everything. So, well, yeah, whenever I watched the video on YouTube, I think it was like, uh, 22,000 views or something like that. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was, uh, we're trying to keep track of it. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard because it's on multiple platforms right now. So it's hard to, to add them all up, but we've just been blown away by the response. I mean, we expected, you know, we have a pretty loyal kind of group that follows most of what we do. And, and so we expected those people to be stoked, but we certainly did not expect 
um, you know, this outpouring of support uh, from all these new people. Um, and we've gotten a lot of positive uh, feedback, people willing to actually not just, you know, go and listen to the song, but take the time out to come and, and post on our social media or even send us a message and say uh, that they enjoyed it. And, and some pretty some comparisons that are all over the board, which is always funny to me. But, um, but yeah, I, I, uh, 21 pilot or I've, bear tooth or fever three, 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 or, you know, it's, it's always yeah, funny. a lot of bands that we don't really sound like <laughs> I'm going to go with 21 pilots because of the reggae influence. Right. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I think people just say that because there's two of us. Sure. So, well, I think like if I'm gonna go ahead and just throw out a comparison now too, then just because I'm doing it, I'm not gonna compare you to another sure. band, but Let's um, do it. Uh, but uh, what well, I like, what what I like is um, I like kind of the rock and roll approach, but you've still kind of got that hardcore, that punk edge to it. Um, especially um, the vocals on the chorus is what really got me as the hardcore guy where you're singing, but also still screaming. And like that, uh, that, that kind of like, for whatever reason, like if you're, if you're a person that's into the, like sc- is just doing a full scream, there's a certain sense of, Oh, well that guy's just doing a voice. Um, <laughs> and whenever you're yeah. like, la, 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 la singing, then hardcore guys are like, well, this band's not heavy, like whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, even though, you yeah. know, heaviness is really more about the riffs and about, <laughs> you know, what's really being played. But, um, we live in a world where people yeah. tend to focus on vocals, um, almost more than anything. And what I liked about, what I liked about that song is that it just, um, toes the line between being an all out hardcore song, but also still having that rock bass. Um, and is that something that you guys intentionally do, or is it just kind of like, this is where we came from, so this is how we sound? A little bit you of mean both, vo- I think. Do you mean vocally, or all across the board? All across the board. Yeah, I would say, like Jesse said, a, a little bit of both. Um, I I grew up uh, listening to um, sort of an aggregate of what we sound like. If you take all the things that I grew up listening to and put them together... Uh, this is kind of what comes out. I think, um, you know, these days there's, there's so many genres and sub genres and everything. Um, and people are quick to categorize. Um, and I think that we just kind of do what feels right. Um, to an extent, you know, we have certain things that, that we kind of, where we kind of draw a line here and there and say, yeah, we're, you know, we're probably not going to do that. We're probably not going to do this. Like you're probably not going to see us get up there, you know, with a mandolin or something like that. But, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and then, and then vocally, um, my thing vocally that I just always want to make sure that whatever I'm doing is not put on. Um, so there are screams or there are parts, uh, higher parts where it's a pitched, you know, yell, um, and those are something that, you know, that's that's me just at the absolute edge of of my range and at the absolute edge of my register, uh, pushing as hard as I possibly can. Um, so it means I have to be, um, you know, careful when we when we're on tour. I have to be smart and, and drinking water and sleeping and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I just I, I never want to be that guy that put on vocal sound that, you know, w- what you see is what you get. I, if you're hearing my, my voice break up and. You're hearing a uh, a clean vocal that's verging on the edge of a of a scream, then you know that that's intentional. And with the song Unbreakable, um, you know, in order to get that, we had to tune our instruments differently and and go into into different territory that we weren't used to, so that we could make sure that it stayed real and it wasn't just something we could create on an album and then never replicate again live. Because uh, you know, I mean, Jesse will tell you too that we're really big about being able to recreate what we do live. Um, we think that rock and roll yeah, the only, is first the only and foremost things, a live thing. The only things that aren't, we get asked a lot, like on that vein of like, is everything, like, is everything real? Or like, I hear bass, but where's the bass or whatever. And like, well, like we don't actually have a bass. Evan does a lot of cool stuff with his guitar that can bring out some, some low end and that's just amplified to make it sound thicker. But like he said, like the only, we kind of decided early on that the only things that we were willing to like put on tracks per se would be like, it, 
like or big orchestral parts like we're not we're not we we always make this reference but we're not like bring me the horizon we can't tour or play shows with a giant orchestra behind us and right like or you know we're not a we're not a stadium band we're playing small clubs and in venues and so like you can't we couldn't fit even if we could afford to we couldn't fit all of them on stage <laughs> like so you know that stuff is different but like as far as guitars and drums and and vocals go like you know i i hadn't sang in a band that i was in previous to this band and when we started american arts and evan was like nope you're singing <laughs> yeah. like you're doing harmonies <laughs> yeah, there's only two of us we both got to sing <laughs> yeah so we were like nope we're not you know we're not tracking vocals so i had to you know kind of teach myself how to well i guess you could call it singing if you want to call it that but um <laughs> you know it's we do our best to recreate everything we can and make it as authentic as possible and that's what we want to be about well and with having with having just two of you um out on the road does that cut down you feel on, on tour costs and I don't want to say equipment because I feel like there's a lot of guitar equipment. Yeah, the um, equipment of a four piece. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause it's funny. Whenever I was um, watching that video, somebody was like, Oh my God, how many pedals does he have? And I was like, he probably doesn't think it's enough. I <laughs> know. I don't. I know. I'm looking at my board. Like how can I fit more? Um, and you I actually got a we, second pedal board. Yeah, I did. Yeah. But I ended <laughs> up just getting a bigger one instead. <laughs> Um, and I actually, I have, a, a, I just finished working on a video that, um, is going to kind of explain my pedal setup. So I, I can just copy and paste the YouTube link when people ask questions about it from now on. There you go. But, um, on the road, it, it doesn't change a whole lot because, uh, we like to bring, um, people to help us because otherwise it gets extremely stressful with us. We, we have a small uh, crew on the road here. with us. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, so usually a normal traveling group size for us is is like five. Um, so in that regard, it's nice because we can bring out a merch person and a tech and a photographer and still only be at five. Whereas if you're a four or five piece band and you're looking to bring out three crew, um, now you know you can't even all fit in the same hotel room without somebody sleeping in the bathtub. Uh, and so it, I guess in that respect, maybe it cuts down on some cost, but. We don't um, often sleep in hotel rooms, anyways. Uh, so <laughs> usually it's somebody's floor, or it's the or it's the driving through the night. Yeah, or just driving, that's, that's driving honestly, through the night. That's honestly more of the more of the situation, I'd say, because we find ourselves lots of times either we have such a long drive between cities that we have to just hit the road immediately after one show and drive through the night, or we like uh, we're so wired and, and wide awake after a show that we're kind of like, well, there's, there's no point in just, you know, sitting around until three or four in the morning and then getting up a couple hours later. So it, you know, lots of the times we're, we're spending most of our nights driving. And like you said, just kind of like crashing in the van once we get to the next place and just taking a, we don't really sleep. We nap on tour. <laughs> yeah. That's like, <laughs> That's more of the thing, but yeah, I mean, we, it's hotels, friends, places, you know, it's, we make do, but you know, having two people definitely makes it simpler from a logistics standpoint, maybe not cheaper, but it's a lot easier to get everybody on the same page with two instead of five. Right. right. Yeah. I just remember being, being in a band and we didn't, we didn't really tour that much, but it was one of those, like, I remember just at the end of the night having the split payouts between five guys was like to a point where I was like, man, this guy that plays keyboards over here is like my best friend, but I want to send him home and I'll play the keyboard parts, <laughs> you know, that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, just because it was so yeah. much of a, it was, it, it was so much of a division. And so I always like, I was like, man, two band, two man band, that makes so much sense to me financially. But I guess from what you guys were saying, because there's only two of you, you have to have more people on in order to make it all happen. Yeah, yeah. and we and we pretty much reinvest everything at, at this point, trying to to reinvest to to push the band to the next point. So in terms of actually chopping things up, uh, I don't know. We'll let you know when we get our first gold record or something. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, yeah, it, we we have you know we run things where you know the band has its own you know separate financial entity and anything we get paid out goes into that and then is used used to better the band like 
you know, it covers, you know, travel costs and, and being on the road and stuff like that. But we're not, we're both blessed enough to have work while we're home. We both have, you know, full-time careers and day jobs um, that are also, we're lucky enough to have ones that let us go on tour. Uh, but we're, you know, like you said, once, once we get to a point where there's enough coming in on the band side of things, you know, yeah, you could say that, like, I guess technically splitting stuff up between a bunch of members is, you know, you're going to get a lesser cut, but that, that's not even what plays into our minds. But if anything, like you said, like it allows for us to put more into the crew and investing on making our tour experiences better and being able to spend money on a hotel when we want to, so we can get a night's nice rest and, and stuff like that, as opposed to, okay, we got to take care of seven to 10 people here, you know? Right. Yeah. So yeah. And that's, that's really smart. You're, you're running a company, you know, more than more, you know, taking care of all of those expenses. It's like a moving, like exactly. a moving co- corporation in a way. A band is a business, you know, yeah. it's a passion, but it's business too. Absolutely. Well, and speaking of passion, I think that that really, um, that really does shine through on your songs. I went, and, like I said, I went and checked out a lot, you know, some, uh, some of the, uh, older material and, um, you guys have always had kind of just a, a, I don't want to say positive because it's not like it's like all happy sing songy stuff, but you guys <laughs> seem to always have a way to put kind of a positive spin on things. And, uh, uh, again, that's one of those, uh, I, I asked this question a lot, which is, is that intentional or is that just, uh, I, I guess like, does the band have a goal or a statement, uh, or is it just kind of a reflection of who you guys are? Love each other. I think. What'd you say, Jesse? I said, love each other. Yeah, that I mean, that's kind of an underlying theme. Um, it, we want people to we want people to care about other people, but I I think more so than like a like a like a stated like or like a mission statement. Um, we just try to be authentic and right from life. So whatever is is going on around us, that could be, you know. Um, uh, our goals, hopes, dreams, our faith, our relationships, um, and just try to be authentic. And, and I know that they're, um, you know, that people who are making way, way, way more money than us doing music, uh, understand that there is a formula and that if you write about certain things, you will get a specific kind of attention, but this is not something that we just try to be authentic and, um, sit down to write lyrics and just think about, what's going on in my life, what's going on the world around us. Uh, and on this album, there are some songs that are going to call out what we believe to be some, you know, fractures in our political system. Um, but we like to do so with um, a message behind it, you know, um, which is unity. Uh, so, so, hey, these politicians, um, they're doing their best to divide you and it's working. Uh, and it's turning you into the kind of person that, uh, you know, draws lines between them and, and says, I'm on this side and you're on that side. Uh, don't let those people do that because they don't have your best interests in mind. And so even I, I guess maybe want. that part is intentional. I guess I guess coming back to your question, I guess maybe that part is a little bit intentional in that, hey, we're, we're going to make a, a statement right now and, and call out something that we don't think is OK. Um, but we're going to try to provide a solution or try to provide at least a, a nugget of thought that people can, um, you know, kind of gravitate towards instead of just, you know, burn the government down. It's, you know, what what can OK, what can we do about it? How can we respond? How should I respond on a daily basis to this issue that's going on around? Yeah, it's weird, too, with with politics. We're not going to actually talk about politics, but I um one of the <laughs> unless everybody's like, oh, I'm good. never listening to this podcast again. Yeah, like, right. um, you know, uh, something a buddy of mine, you know, it's a buddy of mine. I we were talking about politics uh, for some reason at work. I guess just to pass the time, and um, he brought it probably kind of kind of along the lines of what you're saying too. Is that like, you know, reasonably minded people, um, whether you're you lean on one side of the political spectrum or the other side reasonably minded people want the same thing. They just have different ideas on how to get that one thing. And, um, you know, but unfortunately what we're seeing now is on, on both sides, it's everybody kind of like the, the people that are, that are getting elected and are in power are 
very extreme examples of those mindsets. And yeah, it like, causes the they're like caricatures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I, that's interesting. And it's, it's cool to, to hear a band kind of look at it from that perspective. It's weird. How, it's weird hearing you say that. And then I'm thinking back to like my buddy saying that just like, Oh, just like a week or two ago, you know, <laughs> like, and, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, obviously there are more reasonably minded people out there, um, <laughs> than, uh, than maybe we give credit for, but, uh, that's, that's yeah. our big political discussion. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a whole other podcast there. That's, that's for, a whole other episode. Yeah. That's part two. That one will be four hours long and we'll just get really heavy into politics. <laughs> 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 keep looking out for it it's coming but uh yeah it, so you know whenever i was talking earlier about you know a little bit of it's it's a little bit rock a little bit punk a little bit hardcore um what were what were some of the bands that got you guys into music um individually um that, that led you guys up to this point to kind of want to create a band with this type of sound jesse you, you go first uh well I like, I know, like Evan said, like we truly are just kind of a like mix, just a mesh of like all kinds of different genres that we've grown up with. I know we both have very diverse backgrounds, but I mean, like speaking to me, like personally as a musician, like the two drummers and like just overall musicians that, that influenced me a ton, or I guess three really one a little later on, but uh, I grew up watching, like, being super into Dave Grohl, and, and then Aaron Gillespie, when Under Oath came along, um, Dave Grohl is one of my earliest in, influences, and I love the idea that both of them were just so unfiltered and aggressive in whatever that they were playing. Like, that, that's the one thing you could, you could tell through them, aside from being just really talented songwriters and, and musicians, but... Um, their passion for what they were doing just came through in everything they did and they left everything on stage. Um, and then they are also for me, like super well-rounded musicians, multi-instrumentalists guys that, you know, were writing and playing every instrument on some of their, the records they featured on and stuff. Um, and I, I, I really was influenced by that. Um, and then later on a band that I actually have a massive tattoo of let live, um, was one of my biggest influences of all, all time, uh, just as a band, but also Jason Butler, their, their front man now with, you know, fever 333, yeah, um, yeah. they mentioned earlier, uh, same reasons, like his, his unfiltered, just raw aggression and passion for, for what he was doing on stage and for performing and the energy levels, but also for, for being willing, kind of like we touched on to, to be honest in his music, what he was writing about the message that he was putting out there to speak about things he was passionate about and believed in, um, and kind of, and, and not water it down for people. But I guess I'll, I'll let Evan add to whatever he wants to. Yeah. I, I mean, I grew up, I'm old, so <laughs> So um, I grew up in, in a little bit, yeah, I, re- I grew up in a little bit different era of, um, of, of punk and, and hardcore. Uh, I was in high school in, in the late, late 90s and early 2000s. And um, the, it was sort of the, the tail end of the first wave of the, of the emotional hardcore sort of, of run where, you know, obviously the, the whole term emo meant something a lot different back then and so I, I caught like the tail end of that um when a lot of these uh guys who had been in these uh you know bands that were following like fugazi and rites of spring and, and stuff like that um mineral and, and a lot of guys that, that had had been in bands like that or been an influence in bands like that also wanted to sing and and also wanted to um kind of uh, let the more melodic side show through. Um, and it, it, right at the cusp of that was when like, I really got into music. So, um, the bands that got me really excited, uh, when I was in high school, um, and just coming out of high school were like, uh, further seems forever, uh, Jimmy Eat worlds, uh, the get up kids, Juliana theory, um, these bands that were kind of like, they were, they were hanging on to the tail ends of that, of that emotional hardcore movement, but they also wanted to do something melodic and, and sort of crossover 
Um, and so that, that's what really got me going. Uh, it really got me excited about playing music uh, and seeing the energy that those bands brought because, you know, they're playing these, they're playing shows with hardcore bands and they've got to bring the same kind of energy a, as a hardcore band. But uh, when you're not screaming every other word, um, you know, sometimes <laughs> you, you really have to put the effort in to do that. So, um, but yeah, those early Further Seems, Further Seems Forever albums, um, early Jimmy Eat World albums, um, Static Prevails and, and Clarity and um, even the albums that came after that, uh, Bleed American and, and Futures and stuff that, I mean, those really influenced a lot of, of um, you know, my early kind of formative years in music. Um, and then, you know, it's been a lot, there's been a lot of bands to come along since then that have kind of shaped me yeah. further, but I, I was going to say that too. Are. Yeah. There's been a lot of bands even over the past several years. It was funny with Spotify doing their, how they do their like yearly rap thing. They show your top artists for the year and stuff. And this past year they did with the end of the decade at 2019, they did the year rap, but they also did the decade rap. And that was super, I, it didn't really surprise me because I kind of knew who had really influenced me over the past several years, but it was cool to see that way. Like, Bands like, you know, over the past decade, bands like The Wonder Years and stuff um, really kind of took over a huge influence on me. Um, a band called Boston Manor um, from the UK is one of my favorite bands of all time now. Um, the, yeah, it's like you said, it's it's been, it, there's those earlier artists that we mentioned, but there's, you know, there's newer ones that have come along too. I think you can ch- hear in our sound as well how we've progressed since you know the earlier stuff and added more production into it and kind of like filled out a bit as we hear you know bands and records that may have a similar sound but do some really cool stuff and we're like oh that's really sweet like we should write you know some that like inspires us like to to write stuff you know kind of not based off of that but um inspired by that so yeah it's constantly involved evolving especially I, i'm just always trying to find new new bands to get inspired by and, and and get into but no that's cool and you know a lot of those I, I i'm always fascinated to hear what people's formative bands are because then at that point you kind of are putting together a puzzle with a roadmap kind of to get to the band that you are listening to now or the band that you are or in your guys' case, you know, in now and the music you were doing, you can kind of yeah. you can kind of trace it back like a road map. And so that's that's why I always ask that question because it's always fascinating for me to try to connect the dots. Um but the one thing on that road map that doesn't make sense to me uh a hundred percent is uh, you know, what what got you guys in contact with Jason at Face Down? Um, <laughs> I mean with Face Down being um well, let's let's put it this way. Um, there are some pretty tough bands on that label. <laughs> um, I remember oh, yeah, yeah. growing growing up listening to Face Down. That was like, um, you know, if I needed to throw cars or something, you know, you'd you'd have to put on you know some <laughs> Face Down bands. Uh, so, what was that like? For that what was that like for you guys as far as how you came in contact with that label and um, considering <laughs> it wasn't exactly the same chemical makeup. It was super. It was out of nowhere, really, um, as far as like how we came in contact with them. And, and I know we didn't we didn't throw any of them in that that short list. But again, like I could keep going with bands that influenced me, and I know Evan could too. And like earlier, like Comeback Kid records that were on Face Down for me, and like even later later on in the past decade, like bands like For Today when they came along and had their first couple records on Face Down and stuff. Um, and even more recent bands, like been a huge fan and, and, and follower of bands like, you know, comrades and my epic and, and stuff that are on there now. Um, so we, we, we knew we were familiar with face down, but, um, we, it was funny. We took a little bit of a hiatus that Evan, uh, can, you know, talk a little more into, um, but, for for a year and and then we decided to come back with two singles and just kind of like hey we're coming back like we took some time off here's some new music like something to give people kind of um we weren't ready for a whole record but we wanted to come back with something in our hands um and and uh i don't remember totally doing it or exactly when i did it but i remember 
shooting an email to to face down can't remember if it was directly to jason or something and kind of saying like hey like here's where we're at like we're huge you know followers and, and longtime fans of what you guys do and and, and your message and, and what you guys stand for more importantly um and we'd love to connect sometime like check it out you know the general introduction email um and he hit us back like we right before the singles were were set to come out and was like hey love it let's talk let's make something happen and then he hit us back again like a day or two later and was like actually you know what let's just put out these first couple singles as a face down release let's do it now and um it was like a pretty much like a 48 hour transition between when we first hit each other up and when we decided to make it happen that it, it, it wasn't a hesitation on our part i think evan would uh, agree we as soon as we heard they were interested we were like yep like that sounds like home like yeah and from one of the some of the stuff that i've heard from you know bands uh that have been signed to face down is that like that Jason is one of the most enthusiastic um, <laughs> label owners out there in that he's always all about what you're doing and gives, gives personalized, you know, support. Um, yeah. And yeah, so we can confirm that for sure. Yeah. Jason's been awesome to us. I, I think, you know, I, I was aware of of Face Down having some some rock bands um, because I was I was listening to Dens uh, and I was listening to My Epic and I was listening to everything in slow motion. So when we heard from Jason, we weren't t- totally caught off guard. We we did know that um, you know he was interested in signing bands that weren't you know metal bands or or, um, or, or some variation of that. But I think it's really cool to see the support it's you know we don't feel like a token you know punk band on the label it's it's you know you know we we get the same um sort of treatment and attention to detail as uh any of those bigger bands would and um yeah he he's awesome he's he's been everyone there supportive. Is yeah but also just the um, allowing us to kind of do our thing artistically and, and not, you know, um, forcing our hands and uh, not sort of, you know, shoving us down a particular path and just kind of being there to support um, what we want to do as artists. No, that's awesome. Because uh, I've definitely heard some horror stories from other bands, other labels, and, you know, the, oh, yeah. it being like every song, like, um, you know, because like, we're, we're being honest here, uh, Face Down is, is, is predominantly a Christian label. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, but I definitely hear horror stories about other, of the, you know, every song has to be about this, or you have to make every single song about God, or you have to make every single song about, <laughs> about whatever. Um, and I don't know if it's happening as much recently. I do feel like overall that's changed in that scene but um you know i that was one thing that i that i'm really liking about the newer face down roster is the bands all seem fresh um like you guys mentioned dens uh that was one of the freshest records i've heard <laughs> in yeah, a long in a long every, time every single song every single song on the album there's not a single song you would want to skip yeah absolutely i i think I think people in general now, and I don't know if this is um, because social media has kind of made us hyper aware of the people who are pretending, but people in general uh, seem to be pretty decent at um, detecting when something is inauthentic. And so if we were to come out with a record where uh, it was pretty obvious that we were forced into writing something, uh, I I don't think, I mean... I think I think smart label owners realize that too. That authenticity is it's not something that we put out there as like this is our trait that we're trying to market. Um, it's just something that we strive to be in in everything that we do, and um, and we hope that comes across in in the interviews that we do. We hope that comes across uh, in our music. We hope that comes across in the way that we interact with people. And so, um, you know, hopefully people who own labels and who make the, the decisions at a much higher level than us uh, start to realize that authenticity is something that people crave. I mean, that's, a, that's it's humanity. That's what we should crave. And for way too long, the music industry as a whole was based on, was propped up by inauthentic 
uh, behavior um, and and the presentation of inauthentic behavior. Um, and that still happens. And in some genres, it's bigger and more prevalent than in other genres, even in, and, you know, I'm not just trying to scapegoat like the pop genres and stuff like that, because even within the um, the alternative scene, you know, the, the metal and punk sub genres, you have um, in authentic authenticity. Um, and and I mean, that was very, very big in the late uh, 2000, you know, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, right yeah. around 2010 and, and stuff like that. I mean, it was uh, yeah, I, I think the um, the guitar player. I don't, I don't remember if it was the guitar player. One of the guys from Get Up Kids said, man, the, the punk scene that I grew up in has nothing in common with the punk scene that I see now. Um, you know, it, it, this reminds me of like 80s glam, uh, you know, everybody putting on a show. Um, and I think that, that that's just unnatural for us as humans. I think that we crave authenticity. At least I, I like to believe that we do. Um, and, and you know, so Jesse and I have had a lot of conversations about this or just you know, whatever happens, happens um, with our music, but we're going to be authentic. And, and if people don't like it, that's totally fine. Um, yeah. we, we can't try to charm them into it or uh, or trick them into it. Um, and that and the same thing goes for the, um, you know, the 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 faith aspect of it. Uh, if you're expecting us to get up there and, and sing a bunch of um, David Crowder and Hillsong covers, that's not going to happen. <laughs> right. But you are going to get an authentic <laughs> representation of where we're at in, in, in our faith journey. Um, and so if you're I expecting us to keep a lid on it, that's really not going to happen that. either. Yeah. Face down is a great label to come for, for they, authenticity when it comes to faith. They definitely like, like he said, like all of those things that he just said, like face down is all about too. And, and me and Evan are very like-minded people in that sense. When it, when it comes, I think that's why we worked and still work you know, good as a band and it is as a combo. Um, we see a lot of those things eye to eye and, and that's why it was literally, we didn't even have to talk about it when face down reached out. Like I, I saw Jason's email. I, called Evan and I think the phone call was like 20 seconds of like yep okay cool I'll message him back <laughs> like like yeah. like there was there wasn't any hesitation um and, and to touch on like your your question in relation to them like to um all those things that Evan just said like could be said about everybody at face down to like authenticity like passion and what not like you were saying like the horror stories you hear about bands and labels being forced to write certain songs or, you know, switch genres and stuff like that. Like they're not doing that. And, and, and they're, I can't say enough good things about, you know, Jason, Shannon, Virginia, Jim, Dave, everybody involved with the label in terms of like, you know, as, as little or as, as much as we've been involved with any one of them directly, like always just, being stoked on what we're doing while also offering yeah they offer like their advice and their expertise and they've helped us grow um and push ourselves in different directions and different um like you know especially learning how to market ourselves better and how to grow as an artist um and and they're not afraid to like give their opinion or toss ideas our way or say hey try this um which is amazing. But in terms of like artistically, we knew we were going to be in a place and I'm sure you've, you've come across on Facebook, especially with David and, and some people of like the, the face down family group. And like, you see all this like face down family is what it's, re what they refer to kind of themselves as. And that's so true. Like all the way from the fan base, all the way up to the people that run the label, all the bands on the label, um, it really feels more like it's operated like a family than it is, you know, I mean, obviously it's a business, but you know, there's yeah. that more genuine touch to it. And, and really all the bands want to see each other succeed and are rooting each other on, um, same from everyone at the label. Um, and they definitely don't, don't come to us and be like, <laughs> like, sing about jesus more or you're singing about jesus too much or right like, like you know that kind of or thing you're of, singing too much or you're not singing enough or yeah yeah right, more, right. you know well you're totally right i mean the human brain is very very good at detecting fakeness 
Um, and the only visual example I can give the, is whenever you're watching a movie and it's mostly computer generated, <laughs> you know, and, uh, yeah. for whatever reason you can watch that and it have no effect on you, no matter what the image is, because your brain in the entire time is nagging at you going, that's fake. That's fake. That's fake. That's fake. You know? Um, and that's what, and that's what really struck me, you know, um, <laughs> that, that, that's what really struck me about your guys' music more than anything was that like, it's a, um, it, it, you guys wanted to make, like, this isn't a band, um, this isn't a band, that, this isn't a hardcore band that a label has forced into be, being a rock band. Um, this is, <laughs> a, but like, as, as weird as that sounds, that's very prevalent. Um, yeah. Or the opposite is true. A band that really like, like you look at a band, you look at a band like Dens, who isn't, you know, um, they're not like a super brutal band by, by any stretch. Um, they can be that sometimes, but they're not, but like their, their primary focus is like what they do. Um, much, much the same as your guys' primary focus is what you do. Um, and again, that authenticness, it really comes through. Um, just by watching you guys play. And I think that, that was what was great about Unbreakable was getting to see just two guys in a room. Um, one guy with a drum kit and another guy with 4,000 effects pedals. Um, but like it <laughs> yeah, was, I just, I just hit things really hard. That's all I do. I just hit things and yell things. And he, he does all the complicated work. You do hit things because yeah, like I was getting tired just watching the video because like, um, uh, I was like, man, I could never like, I could never play with that much intensity. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, like I said, watching guys like Dave Grohl and Aaron Gillespie coming up, like they were always, and guys like Jason with Let Live, like they weren't so much about finesse as they were just energy. <laughs> I'm far from as, as talented as some of these guys, but they, that was what came across. I, I'm sure Evan puts a lot into his, you know, we're not moving around in, uh, in the video as much but if you've ever seen us live like he's jumping around stage and you know doing posi jumps and and swinging his guitar around and stuff too so it it goes both ways does it ever feel weird being on like a gigantic stage like <laughs> like you like like a, a stage that only like nine member bands could fill up like is it or, or is it just like oh sweet i get to run around now like even more than i did before uh, I'll let you know when we get on a gigantic stage that only a nine member band could fill up. Well, hey, you know, so, hey some venues. <laughs> I've been to some holes we, in mean, the wall. We, that, yeah, we played uh, yeah. audio feed. Yeah, we played it. We played some larger stages, but I like stages where the uh, where the where people are close, no barriers. You know, not too much width. Um, yeah, I don't know. We 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 seem to uh, thrive. The smaller the stage is, the smaller the venue. We seem to it seems to bring out more intensity in us. So I always love it. You you show up at a venue and the stage is the size of a postage stamp. If it's even if it's yeah. even raised at all, like I've I've been I've seen stages that are like as thick as my MacBook. You know what I mean? Like just like. Right, Bar- barely, barely anything, and why aren't we just on the floor right now? We right, should just be on the floor. <laughs> you, you yeah. obviously, you could go old school hardcore and like high school gym, you know. Right. I, yeah, <laughs> those are some of the best shows oh, I've ever yeah. been to. <laughs> you know, yeah, I prefer a ba- yeah, we we'll love it all the time. Basement shows, house shows, or like small punk venues where it's like I would choose a basement show with like packed out with like 50 60 of our you know our good friends or people that are there for the music than playing to you know 10,000 people at an open air festival where you know 9500 of those 10,000 people are just kind of like standing there waiting for the next band <laughs> sure like, sure you know yeah. like and, and there's there's benefits to both like it's yeah it's, it's still fun to play those shows like we haven't played one like that massive but the bigger festivals and and the bigger venues are fun in their own right for different reasons but i you know i get i can't i'll let evan speak for himself but like you know we're both kind of in that vein of like you know we we're the we're the house show like basement show like punk show kind of people more so than the big like you know fancy like you know massive act you know 
my favorite show we've ever played was in a basement in Missouri. Yeah, that's where I'm from. Oh, cool. <laughs> hey, there you go. All right. I made a bit. I made a bit. I probably wasn't there. Um, not because I, I. I don't. I. I don't think I've been to a wow. legit into a legit basement show since I was probably sixteen, seventeen. Um, and then I got really weird and became that guy that only get, went to a local venue and just crossed my arms and stood in the back of the crowd the entire time. <laughs> you come up to the rest of the every to the show band. needs every show needs a handful of those. So yeah, that was my role before I started doing podcasts. But um. No, that's cool. We uh it's funny we actually had a venue in uh Kansas City, Missouri called Bubba Spins that got um it was a house venue and it sucks because eventually it got shut down. Um I think Deathbreaker played ah. there once. Um that was like the uh, biggest band that had ever played there, but uh <laughs> that's totally off topic. But <laughs> they uh they have sound related. Yeah, Deathbreaker has a uh, two new singles out, so you should go listen to them. They're both great. Oh, they're fantastic. Um, you know, I'm going to a happy band. I'm going to toot my own horn. I've heard the record and it's awesome. Oh, sweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's cool. Um, I'm actually You're ahead of us. Well, I'm actually supposed to be talking to Scott at some point, but um he runs a uh he runs an auto body shop, I believe, and um he's been like so swamped with work that I feel so bad for him because it'll be like nine o'clock and I'll be like, Hey, are we doing this interview? And he's like, dude, I'm so sorry, but I've got like six hours of work left. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and I was like, dude, it's fine. It's fine. It, you know, it's a virus. It, your record's not out yet. It'll be okay. We'll, we'll make it happen. Um, right, right. It's cool. And like, I I'm really stoked about like all of the releases that are coming out. Cause I've got the death breaker one to look forward to. Um, I've got, I've got your guys's album coming in July, July 3rd, I believe. Is that, that right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. I remember to think, um, but <laughs> you know, in the record, uh, the record being called, uh, a line in the sand is that kind of along the lines of what we were talking about earlier before I almost dipped into politics. Thank God we avoided that. <laughs> well, Evan. Yeah. It's, uh, First off, it's a lyric from Unbreakable. Um, and but then we just kind of felt like it, it captured uh, where we're at with the album. Just a lot of um, songs where uh, we're talking, you know, hey, this, this is something that we don't want to compromise on, uh, or this is something that we feel really passionately about. Um, so you know, and not about drawing lines, uh, at, you know, as in we want some people over here and some people over there um more uh drawing those kind of personal lines for yourself uh and saying look i've made up my mind um this is where i'm going to stand um because this is something that i'm convicted about and I, I think part of that um is is the willingness to to change and grow as you see the the world around you shift and as you see um a different side of things uh, and so that's why it's a, a line in the sand and not a line in uh, the, the concrete, you know? <laughs> there you go. Because <laughs> a line in the concrete is forever. I love it. I was thinking any number of materials that were going to be mentioned there and not yeah. a, line in a line in the sawdust. Or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Line, a line that would the, probably be even more, more pliable than a line in the sand. <laughs> right. A line in the, yeah, ice cream. I don't know. I'm just spitballing now um <laughs> so i've noticed you know as far as like pre-orders and stuff goes um you guys have a red swirl vinyl version which i think is the one i'm probably gonna end up getting um what uh, how does it feel to be getting kind of like a vinyl release um on on this and are you guys like big vinyl guys or absolutely yeah i mean i don't think either of us are like like <laughs> avid collectors in terms of like compared to some of the people out there but like we we both love you know vinyl and physical records and you know it's it's fun to have i think even as a musician just to hear your your music back on on vinyl and and and, and to have the hold that physical record i actually have one of the i posted this on instagram you know you, you can't see it since you'll be listening to this but one of the test presses here you know, and, and getting, I haven't got one too. So like, it was cool to listen back to that for the first time. Um, but you know, yeah, that, that red and white color, we were really pumped about. Um, it'll be, it was fun to kind of design that with all the possibilities that you can, you can have with vinyl now too. 
Yeah, that's really yeah, I'm cool. I'm just excited to. We've always been a band that uh, tries to do something different with the physical media side of things um, because we all know, I mean, you know, streaming is huge and physical media um, serves a different purpose than it used to. So we've done hand stamped CDs, uh, you know, hand numbered with our early albums. Uh, and then put those sort of into like a collector collector's edition with all three of our first three albums compiled into one series. Um, we've done cassettes, you know, limited edition cassettes. Just and now it's a really kind of have the what the, basically the crown jewel of physical media um, is vinyl. And and as and as a band, um, you know, operating independently. Uh, vinyl can be really cost prohibitive, and so um, linking up with Face Down. Um, and and the connections that they have, uh, obviously they're they're well known for the job that they do with their vinyl and um, the uniqueness of of the different variants that they put out. Um, and so you know we're really excited about that. Um, I, I love vinyl. I have a I have a small collection. I don't have like the best record player in the world. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there's there, there's people who love it way way more than me, but. Um, I love I love the idea that um, our music is now going to be accessible to people who uh, really value that um, that form of media. So the record's going to come out in July, and hopefully by July you guys are going to be able to just hit the road hard, right? Nope. <laughs> yeah, that's we yeah had we a, canceled we had a camp a tour that was canceled for then. Um, pretty much all shows and tours have been canceled i mean i know there's maybe some that haven't made the official decision yet but i even know of some larger tours that haven't announced it officially yet that have been canceled and most have been well i shouldn't say canceled postponed um so it's pretty much looking like like right now we have some shows rescheduled for august um end of august um things like life fest and and audio feed have been working to develop backup plans for the fall um so we're doing our best to move as many as we can well and you guys would know better than me too as far as um you know what are what is the landscape looking like i mean that you guys have kind of been talking probably to promoters and people like that you know you think people are going to start wanting to go to shows what do you what do you think by like the end of the year um next year potentially it's really hard to say yeah i i it's, think every person is different but i you know for us um we've reached out uh looking at some possible late fall stuff and and some people don't even want to book then um just because you know it's it's work to to cancel things and to postpone things and to reschedule things uh, and also there's a pecking order and, and there's other tours. Um, there's other bands that are, you know, larger than us who had their stuff canceled. And if they're, if they want a particular date, uh, when, when the time comes uh, they're going to get it before we do. I, I would like to think that, um, small venues, uh, you know, 300 cap rooms maybe and under would like, would be able to start doing stuff in the fall. Um, but, uh, we just really have no way of knowing. So we're just trying to be flexible and not, you know, dig our heels in too deep and, and not really, I mean, we were just talking about this today, just not getting attached to the dates that we're booking and just yeah. saying we're going to book it. I, if it happens, awesome. And if it, if it doesn't, then uh, we'll, we'll push it back again and we'll just keep doing that as long as we need to. I just told Evan today, like, like I'm almost kind of like we're, we're rescheduling what we can for the fall. Um, like it seems like every day it changes. Like there's one day where I see a report that's like, Oh, we're going to have a vaccine in a couple months now and everything's going to be fine by the end of the summer. And then like, I'll see like seven more reports the next day that say like, Oh, there's no way that groups of more than 10 are going to be allowed till, you know, the new year. Like, it's like, there's not going to be any hope of social distancing easing until next year. And it's like, like, it's so hard to tell that, you know, I, like he said, just not getting attached. And it, like we touched on earlier in the episode, two of, of it's kind of like reschedule things a few months in advance. And, you know, if it happens, then hopefully it happens. And if it doesn't, then, you know, I, I'm kind of personally, I'm, I'm taking a, an approach of similar to Evans of just not getting attached and, and saying, like, you know what, like, I'm not 
I'm not getting my hopes up that any of this is going to happen. And if it does, I'm going to be very pleasantly, you know, surprised and, and hopeful and excited about that. So hopefully sooner than later, but who the heck knows, man. Right. That's my biggest fear right now is, um, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard of the Furnace Fest that was scheduled for this year and is still technically yeah. on. It's technically still on right now. Um, I actually have, like, hotel booked and, and everything for it, but I'm worried, <laughs> you know, that, he, that even well, that's going to go down. That What's that? When was that September. One? September. September, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it could still happen. I mean, it's entirely possible that it may not have the turnout um, expected if it's even allowed. I know here in Missouri, they're starting to open up local businesses and stuff. But, um, like, who knows, man? Like you said, it changes every day. One day, everybody's got a super positive outlook. Like, this is going to – we're we're all going to be back in business in two weeks. And then, you know, another day comes by and they're like, well, uh, hold off on that. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I think festivals in the, sadly, you know, because I had a couple that I was looking forward to going to myself to like festivals and, and big stadium sports events will, that those I, I fully like, I can see why people are saying, you know, 2021, like it might be a while, like, because like you said, I think even just the hesitancy to allow like a mass gathering, but also as Evan said to, um, hopefully, you know, the, the smaller, you know, punk shows and, and stuff like the, you know, two, 300 plus or two, 300 and under, uh, venues will, will be allowed to, you know, get back up and running. And I think, you know, it goes both ways. Like, I think there, there might be some people that are super nervous and hesitant to get back out and get in crowds. Sure. Yeah. But in the, in the punk and hardcore scene, like, especially like so many people thrive on this music in the message in the community that it provides that like I could almost including myself I can almost see it going in the opposite direction of some sort too of like if if we're on true lockdown for six months or through the whole summer you know no shows no concerts and come fall they're like we beat this thing like get back out there people are gonna i'm certainly gonna be stoked to go to as many shows as i possibly can because i miss it so much but yeah just i'm just wondering what a socially di- a social distancing mosh pit looks like um <laughs> <laughs> like i just don't even know how that how that works you know um it's and funny though because like you guys have played summer or you guys have at least been to summer festivals right where like i remember the old cornerstone festivals and stuff it was always dudes with bandanas around their faces <laughs> in the pits i mean it may not may not be that well, different at right at cornerstone that was absolutely necessary because it was always so dusty so you you pretty much had to have a bandana always ready to go at Cornerstone, but yeah, it was it was if if those guys were being honest, it was a fashion accessory too. The oh, it totally was. Yeah, that is there's not going to be enough people there to be too close to each other. So we already kind of naturally social distance our crowds. There you go. Okay, so there's the there's the there there's the uh, oh humility, whatever, man. You know this interview is going to go viral, and then you guys are going to sell like 14 million albums based just on this interview alone. And I'm going to go off to win a Pulitzer <laughs> Prize. You know what I mean? It's like that's the, that's the kind of expectations we're going into this with, right? So, <laughs> um, i going to clip up the the part of me reading off Chuck Norris jokes is what's going to happen. Yeah, I don't know there if that's going to end up in the final cut i kind of hope it makes it but that's all 100 percent <laughs> up to joe my editor so uh you know i guess it's just a, it's gonna boil down to how much he likes you guys <laughs> joe we love you Please. there it is there it is uh you guys can actually so we just did an interview uh a couple i guess a week or so ago with uh andy atkins of a plea for purging um and joe was on that yeah. one so um if you want to, if you want to hear some Joe, you can you can hear him on that on that interview. Um, but it's it's Please. just, yeah. Every now and again, he joins me. I was hoping David Van Zant was going to join us tonight, but he was all like, "I'm an adult and have responsibilities," and I was like, "Oh, that's super lame," because uh, <laughs> we're going to sit here and we're going to sit here and yeah. talk about rock and roll for for an hour. Or so, but cool. Well, I think. Um, 
I think I'm going to go ahead and end it here, but, uh, I want to give you guys like a, like a outgoing plug of some sort. Um, cool. We said, okay, cool. <clears throat> Yeah, I know. So this is how professional all this stuff is. But like when you hear it, you're gonna be like, "Wow, that sounds <laughs> that sounds way better than I remember it." Like, cause this dude, this dude seemed unprepared. Well, what we're, what like, we're gonna tell people is that it, that was our first take. That's how it, they didn't even have to touch it. There it is. Yeah. Perfect. A hundred percent. Cool. <clears throat> Well, guys, I really appreciate you taking the time out to talk. I mean, I know we all kind of have nothing but time right now, but uh, but I do appreciate you guys spending <laughs> spending an hour of it with me. And um, you know, I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing the album in its entirety, "A Line in the Sand," coming out in July, July third, and um, July third, the night before Christmas. Right, the night before Freedom Christmas. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and exactly yeah and uh you know their their first single unbreakable you can listen to that right now you can go on youtube on spotify all of your major music services seriously check out unbreakable these guys are not paying me to say that um you guys know i spend most of my time listening to stuff like cannibal corpse and you know like super heavy bands like that um and yeah. but american arson is a band that is heavy in a way that you're not expecting and and um, I think you guys should check it out. And again, I appreciate you guys coming on. And uh, we will talk again very soon. All Thank right. you so Thank much you for having us. We appreciate it.